Good morning, and I'd like to welcome you to the morning worship service at the Lower Derby United Baptist Church. And to those who are watching by YouTube and listening uh, by Life Radio, I invite you to take your Bibles and to look with me to John chapter 17. We're taking a close look at the Lord's Prayer. This is a prayer that Jesus prayed, not the prayer that he decided that he taught the disciples to pray, but the true Lord's Prayer. John chapter 17. So much of what we do in life is selfish. William Gladstone said, selfishness is the greatest curse of the human race. Robert Browning said, man seeks his own good at the world's cost. And, and those can even be true statements of those who profess to know Christ in a personal way. But that is not true of the Lord Jesus. In the true Lord's Prayer, in John chapter 17, in the first five verses, Jesus is praying for himself, but not a selfish prayer. He is praying that he would be glorified through the cross, so in turn, he would glorify God in fulfilling his plan of love and salvation for mankind. He spends the next 14 verses praying for the disciples in verses 6 to 19. He, he prays that, that those who trust in him will be kept and set apart from the world as they remain in the world. Jesus uses the next seven verses to focus on who would believe in Christ in the future. In John chapter 17, verses 20 to 26, he prays that future believers would be united in him and that the world would believe that the Father had sent Jesus. So in verses 1 to 5, we have Jesus and the Father. In verses 6 to 19, we have Jesus and the disciples. In verses 20 to 26, we have Jesus and the future generation of believers. And the context in verses 6 to 19, the disciples and a chorus that my wife taught me many years ago, we are his disciples, all who trust in Jesus Christ. But there were in particular the 12 who followed him in the beginning, but only 11 truly believed. When we look at verse 6, Verse 6 of John chapter 17 says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave me them to me, and they have kept your word. This verse is, is an important transition statement. After Christ praying for God's glory and, and beginning his prayer for his disciples, there's an interplay here between the human side or the human perspective or the human point of view and the divine side or the divine perspective or point of view of salvation. We're talking about divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Now Jesus expands on these topics because in verses 7 and 8, he talks about the disciples' believing response. And then he talks about God's sovereign election in verses 9 and 10. In this way, the scripture presents the dual realities that God is sovereign in choosing, and also that sinners are personally responsible to receive or reject the message that is presented. You know, I've known some troubled souls who've lost the mystery and, and the balance of Scripture. And, and they're deeply distressed uh, about this teaching. And to be sure, there is an element of mystery from the human perspective, how these two truths work together in the mind of God. But as believers, we should never go beyond what is revealed in Scripture. And try to, to reconcile with our finite minds the, the infinite plan of Almighty God. If both truths are set forth in God's Word, then both should be embraced. Let me illustrate. During the, uh, the days uh, when this man was a, a lecturer at Calvin Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids, 
Michigan. He actually became the president of this university uh, seminary, R.B. Kuyper. He, he used this illustration of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. He said, I, I'd like to liken these two truths to two ropes. Imagine them going up and seeing holes in the ceiling and going through the ceiling. And above the ceiling where you cannot see, they're, they're on a pulley. And, uh, you know, if you grab a hold of those ropes, he said, and, and you cling to both of them, you'll be saved. But if I cling to one and not the other, I'll fall down. The rope will, will come down. And he said, I've read many teachings of the Bible regarding God's election, his predestination, his chosen, and so on. And I also read many teachings regarding whosoever will may come, urging people to exercise their responsibility as human beings. These seeming contradictions cannot be reconciled by the puny human mind. With childlike faith, I cling to both ropes, fully confident that in eternity, I will see that both strands of truth are true after all. One piece in the mind of God. This verse, verse 6, gives us a thesis of what is to, to follow. And so let's begin. In verse 6, it's a revelation of the Father. It's a divine perspective. It's a divine point of view. And first of all, we have the manifestation of the Father's name. The Lord defined those to whom he was praying for. Uh, first, we go back to verse 4, and he's speaking of his disciples who were listening to him the night before he would be uh, crucified. And he made it very clear that, that Christ's earthly mission was to make the Father's name known to his disciples, to his followers. The word manifested, I have manifested thy name. The word manifested translates from, from a Greek word, which means to reveal, to make known, or to show. And, and the tense of, of this word speaks of something that's accomplished. Jesus said, I have manifested your name. And I want to stop there. I want us to, to think uh, about that. In that statement, we have the work of Christ. Jesus came into this world, and he came into this world to manifest the name of God. When you think of, of, of the name of God, I, I want to say that, that the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, when we see the expression of the name of God, it's something very special. The Bible, when it uses a name, it refers more than just the, the name, you know, you know, when you talk and you say, well, well, listen, people, I'm going to tell you the, the name of God, and you think just uh, of, of the name. In the Bible, when the name of God is used, it speaks of his nature. It speaks of his character. Think of names that are used in the Old Testament. Uh, something special about the nature of individuals by their name. Jacob, his name meant a schemer, and his name comes from the Hebrew root word, means to take by the heel. It means to trip up. It means to, to deceive. Think of the name Isaac. That name means laughter in Genesis chapter 21, verse 6, because he brought joy to Abraham and Sarah. And when you think of the names of God in, in the Old Testament, it speaks of his attributes. It speaks of his nature. It speaks of his character. And just a few names. Elohim, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. Think that, that in his great power, he created all things. Jehovah, the God of covenant, the God of redemption. El Shaddai. The all-sufficient one. Now, when we think of God's name, when we think of God's name, Jesus said, I have declared your name. 
I have manifested your name. He's speaking of God's character, of God's nature. And let me illustrate by using a few verses. Psalm 9, verse 10. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. And the point of this verse is those who really know God's character, who he really is, will trust him. A lot of people know just only the name of God. You can go all around the Miramichi and people will know the name of God, but they don't know God because if they knew his character, they would put their complete trust in him and the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. Psalm 20 verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in chariots, you see, that seems ridiculous. It's like someone say, some trust in Fords, some trust in GMCs, some trust in, in Toyotas. No, no, listen to me. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 22, verse 22. This prophetic psalm about the Lord Jesus I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. And, and, and what did Jesus do? A fulfillment of, of this wonderful prophecy in Psalm 22. He declared the name of his God, the nature of his God, the character of his God. It, it means that he opened up to the men that followed him the true character of God. He said to Philip, Philip, have you been with me so long and you don't know who I am? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. It means a lot more than just a title. It means every attribute of God was on display in Jesus Christ. Christ. That's a Bible study for you. I invite you to, to do. Just go to the Old Testament and list all the attributes, all the characteristics of God. And then come to the New Testament and, and look at Christ and you see every attribute of God was displayed in Jesus Christ. And most of all, when you go to the cross, and you see Christ on the cross. You see the wonderful attributes of God. And so Jesus said, I have manifested your name. Now, let's think for a moment. What is the unique name of God manifested to us by the Lord Jesus? And in the context, you look at verse 5, and now, O oh Father, 53 times, in John chapter 13 to verse 17, he uses the title Father when speaking of God. In the Gospel of John, you'll find the title for God, Father, 122 times. Let's look at the Bible's teaching in the Old Testament about the Father. Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. And you are potter, and we all are the work of your hand. Psalm 103, verse 13. As the Father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who, who, who fear him. You see the, the contrast in, in that verse? Father means Lord. No Israelite would ever call God Father. Yet Jesus prayed to the Father, I thank you, O, o Father. He called him Abba, Father. I think of Christ on the cross, and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Lord's use of this title, he was aware that he was the Son of God. He was equal with God. In John chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me. I have not ascended to my Father, 
but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Do you know, when we think of how great God is, do you know that we can call him by faith, just as Jesus did, Father. Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 and 3, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking him by their arms, but they did not know that I had healed them. Do you know God cares for us? And many people don't know God's wondrous care in their lives. God's blessings in their lives. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, Now God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? You think of God revealed as Father through his Son, the Lord Jesus. And, and it was God who gave Jesus the believers and, and, and Jesus taught the disciples. John chapter 6, verses 44 and 45 says, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last days. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. I like the story that H.A. Ironside tells. He, he said, I heard Sam Hadley say once in a meeting in Oakland, California. He listened to a number of testimonies. And, and then he got up and said, many of you have been telling me how you found Jesus. I don't have such a story. Uh, you know, I didn't find him. I wasn't looking for him. He found me, and he drew me to himself from a life of sin and shame. And then he quoted the lines of a familiar old hymn, Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering far from the fold of God. He, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Maybe you've heard the story about the little boy who was asked by, by his Sunday school teacher if he had found Jesus. And, and, and he looked up at his teacher and, 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 and he said, I did not know that he was lost, but I was. And he found me. You see, the first disciples belonged to, to God. They were his. He had drawn them to himself. He had chosen uh, them. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, before we leave this subject, it's a deep subject. But why did the Lord Jesus in his prayer emphasize again and again the sovereignty of God? The answer is very clear. Do you know that Jesus was just about to go to the cross. And, and, and it's important. Uh, it was important for the disciples. It's important for us to, to focus that, that the Father was in control. His plan will, would be fulfilled. And, and, and we need to trust in, in the Lord, even in things that we don't understand. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed to us belong unto us and ours uh, forever. Let me just mention a couple of practical uh, truths when you think of this teaching. The fact that we now believe in Christ gives us absolutely no grounds for boasting in ourselves, only in, in God's grace extended to us. It's not of works. It's by the grace of God. Secondly, the Father gave us who believed in a son that we might be treasured, or that we would treasure the Lord. And, and, and the fact that the Father chose you and gave you to Jesus means that, that he will not lose you. He will keep you. Christ did not die for you because you were valuable. Actually, uh, some teach that, but the truth 
of the matter is that we are sinners when Christ died for us. Third, the fact that you belong to the Father and he gave his Son means that, that you are not your own. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. Think of that. You know, this applies to every area of our lives. If you have trusted Christ, you don't own your own money, your own time, your own thought life. God owns it all, and you can trust him. For if, because God gave us to Christ, our aim should be to glorify him. God the Son glorified God the Father. And we are to live for God's glory. C.H. Spurgeon, in a message, uh, Ask the question, how was Christ glorified by his disciples and how can we glorify him? And he suggests a number of things. We can glorify him. He glorified by saving sinners, such as the disciples and us. And he is glorified when we live holy lives before the Lord. He is glorified when we trust him day by day, especially during our trials. He is glorified when we are full of joy. He is glorified when we tell others uh, about him. So think of this wonderful perspective of God. And, and let's move along to the response of the disciples from verse 6 to verse 8. And, and going from God's perspective to the human perspective, human point of view. And it says, and they have kept your word. Now they have known all things that you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words that you have given me. And they have received them. And have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. These disciples, these eleven, kept God's word. And, and, and their obedience wasn't a work of salvation. It was simply responding uh, by faith. And, and the New Testament inseparably joins saving faith and obedience uh, together. It's a synonym of faith to obey the Lord. So how do we tell those who are true Christians those who are true disciples. We can't tell by outward appearance or, or even by feelings or emotions or by the fact that people go to church on a regular place. How, how do you tell? They keep God's word. The only way you can tell a true, real disciple of the Lord Jesus, a, a true believer is that they continue to keep God's word. From the heart, they, they respond in genuine faith to, to the Lord. He has given them, the disciples, the words which the Father gave them. God has given us his word that we might obey it. The disciples received the word. That word in the original it means holding on to obeying Christ's word. And, and, and on that basis of those words, they know that he came from God. You know, when you think of the world, seeing is believing. But according to the word of God, believing is seeing. In John chapter 11, verse 40, Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? of God. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and, and with fear. You know that, that the disciples, they received the word of God, and, and they believed, and, and they believed in him as 
one whom, whom God has sent and equal with God, that you are the Son of God. You are the Savior's. The disciples believed Matthew 16, verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. John 14, verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the, the Father? And... and and consider this, that, that Jesus isn't comparing the disciples' weak faith before the resurrection and, and they would forsake him. No, Jesus is giving them a, a, a glimpse that he would be praying uh, for them, just as he said to, to Peter, you know, I'll be praying for you. And, and it's a wonderful truth that Jesus Christ today is praying for all those who put their faith and trust in him. Romans chapter 8, verses 33 and 34. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession uh, for us. I like what Marcus Rainsford says in in his commentary, let every let us evermore remember this precious fact: that however in his wondrous grace, our blessed teacher may show us our deficiencies, however he may correct and rebuke us, showing us in our daily experience how needy, how feeble we are, how little faith, yet standing before God is the fullness of our head and representative. He will never allow us to appear before the Father otherwise than endued with all the completeness of his own righteousness. Jesus takes care of us. And, and, and he's praying uh, for us. Let me end with the, the reason for, for this request. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world but the, those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And, and I'm repeating myself, but it's important for us to, to, to get this, that Jesus prayed for the disciples, and he prays for all who, who, who follow him, and, and see how Christ has, has revealed the Father uh, to the disciples, and, and, and to us. And, and Jesus' disciples have been given to him and to the Father. Verse 10, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And Jesus' disciples both belong to him and the Father. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. We're doubly valued. And, and and we need to value what God values. He, he values those who, who simply trust in him by faith, who, who, who don't look to their own wisdom, but look to, to the wisdom of God and, and seek his word to be directed by his word. And God wants to guide us and, and to lead us along. We're such failures. How, how can, can Christ be glorified in us? First of all, by, by saving us, by redeeming us when we call out to him, and, and, and by trusting him in this life. Do you know, Mr. Barnhouse says, what does God want? He simply wants us to believe in him. And, and he wants us to live a holy life. And, and he wants us to confess him before the world. And he wants us to, to be busy sharing this wonderful news that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life.
You know, we who are the followers of Jesus need his prayers. Day in and day out. We need to trust in him. We need to, to, to surrender to him. I pray that that's your heart's desire and to know that he ever lives to make intercession for you. If you've not trusted him as Savior, trust him as Savior. You'll never, never be sorry that you did. And believers, we need to live for him and trust him by faith. And I'll end that by simply saying, Amen.